so alluring. The Rovers Chat YouTube channel is proudly sponsored by SixYardsOut.com. They've got retro football from every era with mugs, phone cases and much more. They also have plenty of Rovers goods including apparel with the famous 94-95 season and this season's kit. Check them out using the link in the description below. Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of the Rovers Academy podcast. Uh, we've spoken to Stuart Jones, head of Academy, who gave us some really interesting answers and also mentioned that Tony will be able to give us some answers to some other questions that you've got and thankfully you've given your questions in your droves. So we're going to split this recording into two. We're going to look at, we're going to talk to Tony about his career and what he does at Rovers specifically and how that impacts the academy setup. And then we're going to uh, talk about the Q&A, the questions that you guys have sent in, hopefully get some some insight for you, uh, for the things that you wanted to know. So let's first of all, just uh, introduce ourselves. I'm Andy Watson. You'll have seen me on all of the academy podcasts and also on the stats show for Rovers Chat. And we've got a guest here, Tony. Hi, Tony. How are you? I am great, Andy. Thanks. Yeah, great to be on. Yeah, um, thank you for coming on, giving up your time. I can see there's a board behind you, so obviously you you've got a few plans in in place there. How are things looking at the moment? I know it's a, a difficult situation recording this on Wednesday the thirtieth. Um, kind of talk us a little bit about what's going on at the moment. Yeah, no, we've um, we've obviously we've got the 18s, under 18s in under 23s, and at the moment the younger age groups are obviously off. Um, during Christmas for a period of time. We were due to get the under-16s in today as well, to train with the 18s, but due to the weather, I think it's minus five here this morning when I pulled up in my car. So we've not been able to get in any of the grass um, and do any of the football training. So it's just the 18s and the 23s who are obviously doing a lot of physical um, a lot of physical work, really, over the sort of yesterday, today, and uh, looking ahead to next Monday when they're back in sort of full-time, the 18s. So just keeping them, keeping them um, sort of working hard over the festive period, really, so they're ready when they come back in. So is that, I mean, have you got them outside in the cold or have you got them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we've, we've been doing a combination of uh, sort of really, you know, some tough gym sessions um, and some running running sessions outside as well. We've been on the on the snow, not the grass, doing a bit of running. Then we've had them doing a little bit of hill hill work as well. So, uh, you know, we want to challenge them physically, but also mentally, which is which is really important um, and, and get as much work in, you know, a short space of time as we can, because we're going to give them obviously three or four days off uh, after today. Yeah, absolutely. Now, obviously, we've only spoken for a minute there, but I think people will be able to tell you you're not from Blackburn or Lancashire originally. Um, just tell us a little bit about kind of where you're from and your upbringing and how you got into football in the first place. Yeah, I'm from um, from a town in Northumberland called Annick, up in up in the northeast, about half an hour north of Newcastle. Um, in terms of football, I've always played from you know from as young as I can remember, having a ball, kicking around and stuff, and then you know you get into your school football, um, your Sunday team. Um, your county team and stuff like that and I just got picked up at 14 by sort of Norwich and Bradford City at the time um, obviously Norwich is a, a long long way from Annick so it yeah. was Brad, Bradford that I opted for um, at 14 school boys and then YTS um, that sort of started the journey really um, in terms of that and obviously you're involved in the academy now and you so when you went to Bradford how different would you say your experience was in the early 90s to what it is now in the early 2020s, I guess now. Yeah, it's I mean hugely, hugely different. Um, I think everything really. Facilities for one is huge now. You know, I look around me here. We know we've got two fantastic training sites. Um, you know, back then it was you know training on um, not park pitches, but not not far off. You know, an old changing room and stuff like that. And I think the games changed massively. You know, the you know when I was at Bradford as a YTS, we probably had two staff. We had one coach mm. and a part-time physio. Now, you know, I look around the academy, we've got, I think, you know, 27, 30 full-time staff just for the under-18 uh, and, this, the, you know, the 9s to 18s, really, which is phenomenal. Sports sciences didn't exist back then. The, the coach did everything. The coach was the fitness coach, the medic to some degree, the psychologist, the parent, the mentor, um, and the, the, the tough disciplinarian as well, you know, all rolled into one back then. Now, obviously, society's changed, culture's changed, and there's a lot of people now do contributing to all of those different things really so it's changed yeah. changed fundamentally um yeah absolutely yeah it's just a massive operation now especially category one level and we'll we'll talk more about that um kind of towards the end of the interview but just sticking with yourself you you like i say you started at bradford city and then you know a lot of people probably won't know that you were involved with blackburn rovers after you left bradford so how did that kind of come about and what was the experience like at ewood and yeah 
94, 95. Yeah, so no, we. No bad second, season to be involved in the club. Oh, really. it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And really, how, how it came about, the sec, my second season at Bradford, we had a really good youth team um, at Bradford in that year. Graham Tomlinson, Man United bought. Des Hamilton ended up going to Newcastle for two million. Um, I had a different path, but we, we did really well in the FA Youth Cup. Uh, we got to the semi final, and one of the teams we played on the way was Blackburn. So we played at Ewood Park. We drew one all. Um, I scored uh, the goal at Ewood Park. I remember getting a broken nose as well. Tommy Morgan, it was at the time, threw me a nice elbow. Um, but then in the return game, we, we absolutely destroyed Blackburn. We beat them 4 0. Um, you know, we beat Man United and different teams on the way. So I think that, that caught the eye then, played really well in both games. And then pre season of 94, um, I actually got offered a pro deal at Bradford, believe it or not, on a Friday in, in April off the manager. The next day, the first team got beat. He got sacked because it meant the mathematics couldn't get in the playoffs. Then on the Monday, I got told my contract was not going to be offered anymore. So I actually had three days, which I, I don't know if that's ever happened, three or four days thinking I'm being offered a pro and then it being pulled away. Yeah. So that, that was tough. Um, but then I came on trial. I went to Newcastle pre-season. They wanted me to go. I went for a month and they wanted me to stay another month. But then Blackburn phoned and said, listen, if you come here for a week, we'll give you a decision. We really like you. So I came down here. We are training at, I think, um, Witten Park, it might have been, in Pleasanton and round there. Um, I, I did well. I had a week played for the reserves up at Roker Park against Sunderland. Uh, we did well in that game. Tony Parks, Alan Irvine and people like that were around. Ray Arford. Um, and then they offered me they offered me the deal for the year, which my biggest regret at the time was they asked me how long I wanted, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, they sort of went, how long do you want to sign for? A year or... And I just went, yeah, a year. Yeah, that'd be great. Because in my head at that time, I think, I don't want another month. I don't want three months. I don't want six. But I think I could have definitely, if I'd have said three, I'd have definitely got two. So that was a regret. Yeah. But, um, but then coming down here, it was fantastic. I mean, I'm tra- you know, you're training at the facility there, which wasn't great, to be honest. But you're training Alan Shearer, David Batty, Tim Sherwood, Colin Hendry. I'm like, wow, this has come from being in the youth team at Bradford to now training with these players. And I think it was round about the October of that season where we, we came down to Brock Hall. We actually moved to Brock Hall for the first time. It was literally like walking into paradise. Do you know, you know, first team players, and certainly for someone like myself, come from Bradford. And it was literally jaw dropping. And it was just a pleasure to come in every day facilities were probably the best in Europe if not the you know at that time if not the world in terms of a training complex way ahead of everybody else and then the momentum that helped with Kenny Daglish the first team doing really well do you know what I mean and um, just a great great place to be around and, and to learn and you know you look back at them what what made it special what made them successful really really hard work everyone sticking together everyone competitive challenging each other no one dipping off for a second in terms of giving everything and then confidence and belief in just the way you're doing things and the consistency and the togetherness. And, you know, I, I still say now, you know, like I say, football's changed a lot in 20 years, but that hasn't. That's what yeah. gets you a long, long way. And all the teams that are successful have that for sure. Um, so, no, it was a brilliant experience for me, yeah. Do you think that that kind of, that year that you had with us, um, you took a lot from that and it set you up nicely for the rest of your career? Because you went on to play loads and loads of games in the league as well. You had a really good professional career. But do you think that was a good foundation for you? Is that something that you still think about now? You talked, obviously, about the, the mental side of it and the camaraderie and togetherness. Is that something you still try to instill into these young people that, that are coming through the academy now? Yeah, 100%. And I think that's the challenge as well in the modern world. I think, um, you know, it stood me in good stead. I mean, the experiences at Bradford as well, you know, getting a pro, not getting a pro, and then having to deal with that, then coming here on trial and earning a contract, then being around those sort of people in this environment. Um, and the big the big thing for me was during my time here, everyone loved being here. Everyone loved, all the players love football. They love the challenge. They love knowing they're in with a shout of the Premier League. They love the pressure. They embraced it, but they just love football. The enthusiasm and the energy in the building was phenomenal, you know, from everybody. Um I think that that's that's a big thing. I mean, I'd be in the gym on the morning. Alan Shearer would be in doing loads of leg work every day because he'd mm. come back, you know, from a crucial ligament every day. He never missed. Graham Lasso would do a thousand press ups and sit ups every day, and he'd be out every afternoon doing free kicks. I'd go out with him, you know, left foot. We get a wall up and that. And th- these are the top top players who went on to be successful. So, this is these are the things we've got to instill in our young players. And I think the perception of hard work twenty years ago is a lot different to the perception of hard work today. Mm. I think 20 years ago, hard work was hard work. You, you worked really, really hard. And I think now hard work, it's different. It's different. So we've got to challenge the players and you know the best work harder than everyone else. 
and, and you know the harder you work the luckier you get we've all heard that so it's shifting mindsets and developing that understanding is that listen somewhere somebody somewhere is probably doing a lot more than you yeah somebody somewhere so what, what are you going to do about it and they've got everything here they've got everything staff facilities don't waste it but it's up to us i think to to educate them and help them understand what that looks like to try and get to the top and be the best that they can be because saying it and doing it and working towards it are, are two different things yeah i remember daily thompson once gave a quote saying he used to go out for a run on christmas day because he thought that his big rival at the time would be doing the same thing so yeah. he would have to go out and do it he'd have to do more he'd have to work harder than the others to be able to stay on top 100 percent. i love a quote from stephen curry as well in the nba he says oh the or the habits that you have today in line with the dreams that you have for tomorrow. And I think that just about sums it up, really. Do you know what I mean? I think it's a brilliant way of putting it. Or the habits that you have today in line with the dreams that you have for tomorrow. Because if they're not, you've got to do something about it. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be a reality, yeah. So I'm not good. So you still haven't played like a first team game by the end of '95. What happened? Did obviously we'd won the title, and um, so you're kind of in the the big, the best kind of club in the country at the time. What was the conversation like with the staff at the time and, and how did you end up getting getting your move to Darlington? Yeah, it was it was interesting. Really. I mean, I got injured here um, probably in the January, um, February. It was really, really difficult injury, really. I uh, got injured playing the A-team. It was on the 19s of Tramina. I actually took myself on the Saturday night. I lived with Shea Given at the time and uh, they were going out um, in town and uh, I actually took myself to the to the hospital for an x-ray because I was in that much pain. I came in on the Monday in crutches and... Uh, the physio at the time here, I won't name him, but he wasn't having it at all. Um, he tried to rush me back a lot. And I literally ended up being out, I think, for about two or three months with this injury. And it was it was the sorest thing I'd ever had. Um, so in the end, in the end, you know, I got told I wouldn't be getting a new contract here. I think that definitely played a part in it, you know, because I'm, I'm aware now of conversations physios have with staff. Uh, you right. learn about them things as you go on. And it, it certainly wouldn't have been a true picture of, how I was feeling at the time because the one thing I wanted to do was play all the time I was passionate about being on the grass I hated being injured and stuff like that but I think that definitely contributed I think Dave Hodgson was um now he played with Kenny Daglish at Liverpool they were good friends he just got the manager's job at Darlington which was obviously in the northeast in League Two at the, at the time uh, they had had conversations so he sort of teed it up for me when he you know I went in to see Kenny he said listen we're not going to be renewing your contract uh, you've been injured a while and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there's an opportunity here at, at Darlington with Dave Hodgson, a friend of mine, you know, he's looking. So I went up there for a few days and, you know, I ended up signing um, for Darlington, went into digs initially, but then moved back to Annick once I sort of the car out and that. Um, and I had a couple of years there, just like you say, gaining experience and playing games and, you know, played in there. You're still very young at this time. I think you were 19 where you left Roberts. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, 19. So to go, like you said, to go and start playing first team football was was good. I look at our 23s now, for example, and, you know, you have a lot of lads in the 23s who get to 19, 20, 21, 22, and still haven't played a first-team game. Mm. So by 22, I'd probably played 100, 150, you know, 150 maybe by that time. So, again, from a development point of view, we've got to try and get different experiences into our under-23 players to, to, to prepare them better for league football. Certainly for me and back then, it may become a lot sooner without that sort of 23s um, opportunity. Yeah, I did some research not so long ago um, about the number of minutes that young people play. And there's a correlation between the number of minutes that you get first team minutes between the ages of 17 and 21 is the strongest correlation between then going on to be a high valued player um, yeah, later, in, yeah. later in career. So um, getting those minutes at Darlington, then going on to Cardiff, Chesterfield, Carlisle, Oldham. Um, you obviously saw a long career there and then going on to Huddersfield at the end of it. Do you want to pick out a couple of highlights from that playing career and and, and maybe some um, good good times that you had? Yeah, some I, think, I, think, I think a couple of high, highlights, even though it was a, probably my biggest disappointment, was the playoff final in uh, 96 for Darlington against Plymouth. We got beat 1-0 at Wembley, but it was the old Wembley, so a great experience. We battered them in the game. We had most possession and stats must be ridiculous, but Neil Warnock managing Plymouth, the set piece did us 1-0. <laughs> Well, uh, something never yeah. changed. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then I, I had good experiences everywhere. You know, everywhere I went, good, good and bad. Really, I, a lot of injuries in my career. I had eleven operations during my career. Um, ultimately, I, that finished me at thirty. So a lot of resilience I had to show to keep coming back and keep getting fit. Um, my first season at Oldham, um, in terms of individually, I won all four Player of the Year awards. So for me personally, that was a really big achievement. You know what I mean? Um, that that was good. And then Huddersfield again, play a final, win the Millennium Stadium against. Mansfield. Uh, I scored a good goal during my time at, at Huddersfield, which 
people still remind me of now, which is nice, you know, especially having kids of my own, even though they're girls, 13 and nine, I show them plenty of times. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. um, not impressed, but anyway. So no, no some, some, some highlights. Probably probably one of the biggest things that I, I didn't realise at the time when I was playing, I always thought every time I was injured and I, and I broke my leg, I had operations and that, I always... I always thought it's all right because I'll get back. I'll, I'll get fit. I work really hard. I was always one that was in the gym. I was always good at cross country as a kid. I thought I'll always get back fit. So it never worried me. It was only when I really moved into coaching, when I reflect, and I think, wow, I missed a lot of practice, actual mm -hmm. football practice. And I didn't really, that didn't really register with me at the time. Do you know what I mean? Like if I, if I played to 30, I probably had four years out of my career where I actually didn't kick a ball. And just in terms of development of me as a player, I think I missed a huge, huge chunk of development of actually playing football as well as obviously time out, you know, in terms of my body. So it's something I look up now and think, yeah, I didn't appreciate missing practice at the time. I just always thought I'll get back to where I was, but yeah. So you very much described to the practice is extremely important. I was going to say practice makes perfect, but I was told at 17 that practice makes permanent. If you're practicing badly and doing the wrong things in practice, then you know, you're yeah. making that permanent. It's got to be quick, high quality practice. But you yeah. think that, that is the, the key, really? To be yeah, De definitely. I mean, practicing the wrong thing, the golf swing will definitely back that up. <laughs> you me back both, up. Yeah. But no, um, I think, I think yeah, practice, being out there, making decisions, having as many touches of the ball as you can, challenging your awareness all the time, learning the game, little tactical triggers that you're picking up on all the time you're playing, all the things that players probably don't appreciate fully until maybe going to coach and you reflect back and think, wow, I missed huge chunks. And Oldham, you know, Oldham, when I won the player of the year, was probably the one season apart from Cardiff where I actually played every game mm -hmm. in my whole career. There was always an operation or, a, you know, a plaster cast, you know, somewhere. But I got a real run of games then. And at Oldham, as in Cardiff, I knew, you know, I knew on a Saturday that I was fine. I was going to be, it felt really good. It wasn't, I wasn't coming back or getting, I just felt great. So, you end up not thinking about anything, just the game. Um, yeah. it makes a big, you just feel more confident, which is obviously key to performance and developing. Yeah, I get that, absolutely. Um, so after, you say you finished at 30 there. Um, was that down to injuries as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, it actually started when I, when, I, when I first signed for Darlington. Um, I remember playing in a game and I got absolutely two-footed. Um, I got stretched off. The, the guy crunched my knee. Uh, and I needed I needed an operation on my cartilage off the back of that tackle, took a big chunk out. So you could argue maybe that the clock was ticking over time. Um, and then in the end, at 28, I had another operation on that meniscus in my knee. 29, started to struggle. And then I had a bit of a, what they call a microfracture done at 29, where they drill the bone and regrow it. Long story short, that certainly didn't work. Um, <laughs> which led to, led to me having to retire at 30. I mean, touch wood. You know, 14 years later now, my knee is actually miles better than it was when I was 30. Um, had it been Bradford wanted to sign me on a two-year deal and Colin Todd was the manager at the time and he's more or less saying, listen, just just grit your teeth on the medical, don't worry about it. And I'm like, I can't run. He said, oh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. Just get through it. And I, and I knew physically I just couldn't physically do it. But, you know, for a lot of years afterwards, I know I would have passed that medical. But yeah. uh, one door closes, another one opens. That's the way you've got to look at it. So what opened for you then? You you, you actually did some studying straight afterwards. Um, what did you have in mind? Did you think of going coaching? or Because your degree is not in, in sport coaching, is it? No, no, no. I, I always wanted to be, uh, even from a kid, I always thought I want to be a manager, coach, probably more a manager than a coach. But I think, you know, what did you have in mind? I think you've just got to go and make things happen. I think um, I, I was already doing my coaching badges. Um, I was working for the PFA doing some stats on games. Um I started a degree in sports journalism through the PFA. Um, the only reason I did that, if I'm honest, is because it was a two-year fast-track degree course. I should have done sports science, which would have been three years. It would have, I would have benefited more from that in my role now, but I, I didn't. I took the, the shorter route. Me, me, my wife was pregnant with our first child at the time, so I didn't like the idea of being in uni for three years. thought, I've got to go on, get a job. I, I started volunteering, coaching at Huddersfield. I was doing coaching at Preston. Um, I was, I was coaching the Oldham Disabled team on a Monday night. I was doing, doing the Young Offenders on a Thursday, so, and I was working in primary school. So in terms of experience, I literally threw, threw myself into everything, everything possible, um, all different types of coaching, all different types of people, ages, abilities. Um, and it was, it, it was really good for me, I think. It was, um, you know, um, just, just to give, to invest my time in all those different types of, you know, people and, and, and ages, I think it, 
it stood, it stood me in good stead as I, as I moved into streamlining into what you'd call maybe more professional coach in terms of you know the football club and stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Stand you in good stead. I have had experience coaching in university and also like say offenders and people rehab and things like that and just meeting all different types of people and working out different ways of getting through to people is actually yeah. really really good um in stand you in good stead like say in your role now so how did do you get back involved at rovers what was the what was the process in terms of getting back involved here yeah i I'd obviously a coach then full-time at huddersfield for probably nine years um which led to me taking the under 18s as lead coach for sort of three or four seasons and assisting the 23s then I'd moved into the head of coaching role, which the Premier League sort of rolled out probably four years ago now. Um, I'd been doing that six or seven months, and then there was obviously a big shift at Huddersfield um, around the academy. Um, I didn't know at that point when I left what was going to happen. Um, we just got the Premier League, so I was hoping they were going to go cat one and blow Leeds, Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday, Barnsley out the water and really yeah. go that way. As it transpired after I'd left, it went the other way. Um, the academy manager left, and they, they wanted me to sort of become the academy manager. Um, I, I My concern was like, I'll, I'll lead people if we're going somewhere where we all want to go, but I didn't want to lead a lot of people to the edge of a cliff. And my, my concern was that, you know, if certain things happen with the academy, then I'm, you know, a lot of people I know really well are going to lose their jobs. Um, and it also pulled me away from the grass a little bit in terms of coaching, academy manager. So there's a, a few reasons and one or two others why I was looking, looking then at that point to leave um, Huddersfield. I've seen the, the, Blackburn role advertised and obviously for me Brock Hall coming to, you know the, the, the chance to potentially come back here and work at Blackburn which was a club that I loved that me, me fondest memory in football is the year I had here um, mm -hmm. and it's a category one academy as well which would have was obviously a, a progression from Huddersfield who were category two at the time and I came for the interview a really long process um, I presented to the academy manager Stuart Jones and David Law first team coach um, I then did a practical um, coach development session with a lot of the Blackburn coaches watching. And then I had a bit of a, a, a sort of an hour's interview with Tony Mowbray and HR and, you know, David Lowe and the academy manager were in that. So it was a really thorough process, which I enjoyed, to be fair. Um, it was it was good. And then I got, obviously got the call off, off the back of those interviews and, and it sort of went from there, really. Brilliant. And what season was this then? Was this our... Oh, uh... This was um, 2017, August 2017, yeah, so... I've been here sort of over three years now. So at the beginning of our League One season, was that? Yeah, beginning of, yeah. 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 And so were you surprised then that you they were kind of keeping the Category One going, even though we're in the third tier of of football? No, no, not at all. I think you've got to look at, you've got to look at the, the, the history and the, and the value that the academy has brought to the club. I think, you know, I think it's paid for itself. I think the club's probably in profit over the years in terms of sales and stuff like that. You know, you look at the squad, certainly at the minute um, and, and over the last season or two or three, um, the amount of players that have gone in there, you know, people like Travis, Daryl Lenahan, Ryan Niambi, David Rea, who we sold for a lot of money. Then you've got Joe Rankin Costello, John Buckley's in and around it. Jack Bale hopefully will come through, Dan Butterworth and then Hayden Carter. And there's a lot more. And you know, this goes on, yeah. Really, yeah. And to be honest, probably the most excited I've been now in the three years that I've been here in terms of the quality of players that are actually in this building down here, you know, in terms of the... Um, the players that we've got in our under-17s, under-18s, under-16s. We've got some really, really top talent. Um, there's a lot of clubs watching our players, which tells you that as well. And, you know, the challenge for us is to make sure they stay with us for as long as possible and they end up, you know, up at the, up, up and around the first team or in the first team where that's when the real value becomes clear. Yeah. Stuart said that the obviously the ultimate aim is to develop Premier League players for Blackburn Rovers. Hopefully, you know, taking us all up there. But, you know, there's other ways that the way that can be financed, whether that's through player sales or whatever. But I guess your role then, drilling down into your role specifically, is to do what? What do you do on a day to day basis? And how does that fit into the whole structure? Yeah. So, uh, so the original task was to come and align everything from first team all the way through the, uh, the academy, through the age group, so that all your, all your different age groups are trying to play the same way with the same key principles. Um, that, that's that's the key thing and same messages from the coaches the big the big thing for for us and for me is it's all around the individual do you know what i mean it's about what does the individual not the team not what team be what it's about the individual player what do they need um like i said to you earlier we've got that many staff and that many departments in the build and it's for me daily it's it's making sure that everyone's working together everyone's on the same page got the same understanding and everyone's working as hard as they possibly can and as effectively as they can to make each player better 
Um, we've got different ways of doing that. You know, we have a lot of meetings about different things. And like I say, it's different for every player. And I think, I think that's the key thing. And, you know, we play players in positions coming through that we think they've got an opportunity to play long term. Not, not playing them in positions that will make the team better now at whatever given age group that is. We've got to, and my job is my my job's always the bigger picture, always the bigger picture. I'm not emotionally attached to any of the teams, like you know what the coaches are who take teams. I can I can see it from a slightly different lens, and also with a really good understanding of what it needs to look like at the end, and what little bits help you get there. Um, and you know the staff have been great. Everyone's bought into it. Um, you know we do loads of individual sessions across all departments. Um, and it's just evolving that and developing it really so that we can, you know, we give each individual player the best possible opportunity of getting them into our first team and, you know, to the highest level. And so tell us a little bit about how it works right at the grassroots. So we go down to under nines, did you say? Or? Yeah, yeah, under nines. Yeah, we've started under, we have a pre-academy under sevens, under eights, um, which, you know, when I came in, well, that wasn't necessarily linked directly to the academy. You know, it was pre-academy and then the lads come in at under nine. Well, We've joined that up together. I thought it was really, really important that lads coming in at under nine, that the academy coaches had a big part in not just their development prior to that, but also the selection process. Because, you know, with all due respect, the most qualified coaches are the ones in the academy um, that need to support the coaches in the pre-academy. So we've done that, which will hopefully make us much more effective at that early age. Because ideally, you know, we want to get lads in at nine and 10 and, and get them all the way through, like your John Buckley's and people like that. So... We've got to work together, like I said, to, to give us the best chance of doing that. Um, and yeah, it's it's about putting coaching programs in place, timetables, schedules, games programs. Um, we'll track games from under thirteens up, so game type. So I'll give you an example. We had two years ago, we had sort of twenty players at under fourteen, and what would happen is we'd organise two games every weekend. So some the games program in Man City, Man United, Liverpool, Everton, but we'd arrange additional games against Sheffield United, Barnsley, and things like that. Now, our two best centre backs at that time would always play in the games against Man United, Man City, Everton. But then when I looked at them individually and said, "What do they need?" Well, they have to improve the heading. They have to improve clearing balls from out the box. I'm saying, well, from an individual point of view, they need to be going to Barnsley, Sheffield United, Sheffield Wednesday, because with all due respect to them teams, they will throw it in your box all day long. Whereas yeah. Man City will keep it on the grass. So we, we track and monitor what game types the lads are playing so that if we're arranging friendlies, we'll try and arrange it for a specific reason or for specific players. So it's it's just look, you know, chunking it down into a lot of detail, really, and a real thought behind what we do and why we do it, ultimately to, to make the players better, not the team. And you kind of came in with the interview and you spoke to Tony Mowbray at that time. Did you find that your footballing kind of philosophies aligned? And is that something that's important in your role to align with what Tony and, and Mike Venus and Damien Johnson and the rest of the staff want? Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, I knew about, obviously, the gaffer before, you know, from managing other clubs. He, you know, he's well-respected and highly regarded as a football and manager. These teams want to play football and stuff like that. Came across, obviously, in the interview as well. And one of the first things I, I did in the sort of week or two weeks after I got the role was to spend a lot of time with the manager um, I showed him a lot of, he, he told me about his philosophy and his thoughts and key principles. I showed him some videos and stuff that we've been working on at Huddersfield and it almost, you know, perfectly aligned really to the fact where I actually then showed, you know, he asked me to show the first team staff these videos um, about, you know, um, principles of playing philosophy and that linked directly into, into, you know, the manager's philosophy and what they wanted at first team, which obviously made my job easier because, you know, I'm passionate about football and, and, and you know, to, to be able to invest all of that in the same thing was important. Do you know what I mean? And the same beliefs and the same understanding. Um, and I think obviously for the manager himself, you know, he wants someone coming as head of coach who's going to do all this work. It's got to be aligned to, to what he believes in and what he believes the club should believe in, you know. And I think I think that's the big thing as well is in academies, you know, having, having philosophies and, and, and principles that are sustainable over time. And that, you know, the club believe in, they won't necessarily change. If there's changes, I think, you know, the, the best clubs and the most productive clubs have that. And, uh, you know, I think that's what we've got now. And do you think that's even coming from above Tony Mowbray now that even, you know, let's just say Tony gets ill or something and someone else has to step in for a while. Do you think that this philosophy, even after Tony and Mark leave, this is going to carry on being almost the Blackburn Rovers way of the way that we, we coach our players? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I hope so for sure. You know, I, 
a hundred percent it's what I believe in and what, what the academy believes in and, and obviously like you say Mark uh, the manager and the staff up there believe and we all believe in the same thing you know if if one day there's, there's ever a change and, and you know then hopefully the club you know invest in someone like 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 the manager now with the same beliefs and philosophies you know what I mean so that there's a consistency there you know um, but you know for us in the academy having someone like Tony Mowbray has been fantastic. Do you know what I mean? And is fantastic because, like I've just said, we all believe in the same thing. And I think if you're passionate about football, you're passionate about development, it's massively important that you've got someone who's who believes in you as well at, at the top of the club. Um, I think, you know, I think we'd all find it difficult if someone with the opposite beliefs came in yeah. and then wanted us to start, you know, shelling it and knocking it along. It's, it's a really difficult thing. But I think if you look at the modern game and all the top teams in the game, that you know, what the manager wants here is what all the best teams and the top teams are doing. So if we want to produce as an academy players for the future in the Premier League, that, that, that this is the way we've got to play and this is how we've got to develop players. Yeah, absolutely. I'm 100% behind that. I think all of the fan base can see the changes that have been happening over the last year or so. We're just hoping that the results in the first team will pick up and we're allowed to get some momentum in that first team to show the good work that is being produced. Um, we're just going to leave it there in terms of the interview, Tony. Hopefully you'll be able to stick around with us for a yeah, Q&A. Yeah. Thank you for that so far. Brilliant. Cheers. The Rovers Chat YouTube channel is proudly sponsored by SixYardsOut.com. They've got retro football from every era with mugs, phone cases and much more. They also have plenty of Rovers goods, including apparel with the famous 94-95 season and this season's kit. Check them out using the link in the description below. So alluring, 